So the curve C has parametric equations x equals 3t minus 4 and y equals 5 minus 6 over t, where t is strictly positive. So, part A, let's find the first derivative dy over dx in terms of t. So the key idea really is to think about how to differentiate these set of equations and, and rewrite them in the correct form of dy dx. A cool way is to use something known as the chain rule, and that is, is to say this. We could say let dy over dx be written in forms of d, dt's as well. So think about, if this is algebraic fractions, we need to have a dy up here, divide by something, times something at top times dx. And this is kind of um, a little partition. Because we work in terms of t, it's, why it's advisable to put dt's in both. And just if you're unsure about why it's like this, if you were to cancel, if this is algebraic fractions, you'll notice that dt's both cancel out. And again, you get dy over dx. So yes, and if you're going, if you're differentiating in terms of other terms like x and t, you're going to use dx or dt, or differentiating y in terms of t, dy over dt. So that's exactly why we do it. So what is the solution here? So first things first, we cannot do dy dt. We can do dy over dt. So look at five minus six over t. We could rewrite this equation as five minus six times t to the power negative one. And then differentiating this is quite easy. This would just give us, firstly, let's differentiate. We should get, well, 5 is nothing, and uh, minus 60 power negative 1. Drop the negative 1, and we should get exactly positive 6 times t to the power negative 2, or 6 over t squared. So we can write 6 over t squared times. Now, as for the other expression, what do we have here? So, Ooh, just have a look. So we've got we're differentiating x terms, so that's easy. This should give us just 3. And because it's dt of dx, this is the reciprocal. Because the first, this part here will give us dx over dt, which would just be 3. So therefore, dt over dx should be 1 over 3. It's upside down, yeah? So it'll be times 1 over 3. Okay, not bad. And that's it. Now we just simplify this, guys. So just do some cross simplification. So 6 and 3. They both go to 3, so that's once and twice. And it's just literally 2 times 1, which is 2. And t squared times 1 is t squared. And that's it, guys. Part A is complete. Let's move on. So, part B. So, the point P lies on C where t equals half. All right, cool. Find the, um, the equation of the tangent to C at the point P. Okay, so that's just a general idea. So, first things first. We're talking about a typical um, straight line equation, so y equals mx plus c will do, where m is your gradient, which we have in the previous equation, dy dx is the gradient equation, and we know the value t here, so t is half, so we can say 2 over half squared is the gradient. So let's put a note there, so m equals 2 over half squared. And if you're not sure, you can literally just put down a calculator, and in doing that, you should literally get... Now, this is the easy part. So now our final uh, equation is now y equals 8x plus c. So now we just need to find the x and y coordinate to get c. And since we know the point p lies on c where t is half, we can plug in the value for half for t and then get our x and y coordinates. So let's do it. So we can say x equals 3 times half, so 3 over 2 minus 4. And y equals 5 minus 6 over half, so... 12 in other words 6 over half is just is just 12 now putting this all in the calculator i mean it's not too difficult but you know this is a calculator so bear not to get wrong the first one will give us negative 5 over 2 and then the y solution should give us well negative 7. And that's it now plugging these into the gradient equation so i'm just going to change color pen what do we get so we should get uh minus 7 equals 8 times negative 5 over 2 plus c, hence putting this in the calculus, so making c the subject, you can, you can have minus 7 take away all of this term here, so minus 7 minus 8 times minus 5 over 2, you should get 13, and voila guys, that means that the final solution is going to be now, the, the, the equation of tangent is going to be y equals 8x plus 13, where p is um, 8 and q is 13. Alright. Okay, here we go. Part C, guys. So show that the Cartesian equation for C, basically the above pair of equations, can be written in this format. Where y equals ax plus b over x plus 4. And a and b are integers here. 
So, all right, so what does this mean? So if we look at this carefully, you can notice that there is no more t equation. Why? Because a Cartesian equation is always in the form of x and y. So this is telling us that because we're referring to c, i.e. the first pair, we need to somehow eliminate t. So it's pretty much substitute out. And that's it. Once you do that, play around, you should get this equation. So let's have a go. I'm going to take the first equation here, the x1, because I realize that the x equation can be easily rearranged with t subject. And by doing that, we can just add 4 across and divide by 3. So we can have x plus 4 all over 3, and this should give us t. Now, all you want to do is plug this back into this equation. Now, that's really it. So just to make your life a bit easy, let's try and find an expression for 6 over t here. Yeah? So the way I'll do this is firstly take the reciprocal of this equation. So we're going to have now um, 3 over x plus 4 equal. Now at this stage, we just need to multiply 6 across. And now we finally have 6 over t. So this should give us 3 times 6 is 18 over x plus 4 equals 6 over t. That's it, guys. Now let's plug this back into the y equation. So let's do it. So we're going to have y equals 5 minus 18 over x plus 4 and now the key idea is is just to get a common denominator so everything is over x plus 4 so this 5 must be over x plus 4 and to do that just literally rewrite as 5 over 1 and multiply up and down by x plus 4 and this should give us well 5 times x plus 4 should be 5x plus 20 all over x plus 4 minus 18 over x plus 4 all right, not bad. So if you guys got this far, well done. And now finally, let's wrap it up. So now we're just subtracting. So because of the same denominator, it's all over x plus 4. And this means that 5x plus 20 minus 18, or 20 minus 18 should give us 2. So it's going to be 5x plus 2, guys. And that's it. Hope this helped, and I shall see you guys in the next question. Ciao. So what do we have? So we're given a function 2 plus kx all to the power of negative 3, so I'm guessing this is a binomial expansion, where the absolute value of kx is less than 2, okay, and k is positive. The binomial expansion of the function in ascending powers x up to and including the term x squared is given by the following, where a and b are constants. So here, let's write down the values of a. All right, that makes sense. So let's try and figure out the value a. So the key idea is that this is just an expansion of the first term, meaning this is equal to this term. So the co in terms of coefficients, we can find it. So let's have a go. So we need to know firstly how to do the binomial expansion formula. Well, the general formula is always like this. It's always in the form of 1 equals ax, 1 plus ax all to the power n can be written as in any term, in any power, is always 1 plus, and then you have to be very careful. Is going to be n times ax, so the power times ax, plus the next one would be a descending power order, so it would be n times n minus 1 over 2 factorial, so this is the second term, and then the ax squared, and then it's the same format, you just keep descending this by 1, multiplying the descending by product over 3 factorial, and so on. Now, because of the x squared, we're going to leave out that point, yeah? So let's go ahead and do this. So we can instantly say what? that this equation here, 2 plus kx, needs to be written like this. So I'm going to do on this side, so 2 plus kx to the negative 3. Well, we can firstly, to get to 1 plus, we need to take 2 out. So to do, we need to take 2 to the negative 3 out. So this is 2 to the negative 3 out, and we've got 1 plus. Because we took 2 out, we need to, well, you know, divide this by 2. So it would be kx over 2, all to the negative 3. And that's it, guys. And if you realize this part, ax, a in this case would just be k over 2, and n is just negative 3. So that, that's an easy expansion. The only difference is now is that we're going to multiply all this by 2 to negative 3. So we can say that the expansion would be 2 to the negative 3, 1 plus. Oh yeah, guys, so I'm going to actually, I'm actually simultaneously doing the other questions as well, yeah? So 1 plus, and then k over 2, so n is going to be negative 3, so it be minus 3 times k over 2x plus, and then we're going to have next one, minus 3 times, going 1 back. If you go 1 back, it will be minus 4, guys, yeah? So it will be minus 3 times minus 4, all over 2 factorial times k over 2, all squared. That's it. And oh yeah, big bracket, guys, yeah? Never forget the big bracket. 
So firstly, what's 2 to the negative 3? Well, that's just 1 over 2 cubed. And 1 over 2 cubed is 1 eighth. So we're going to have 1 eighth. So everything is multiplied by 1 eighth. And now expanding the inside, you've got minus 3k times minus 3k over 2. So that's just, that's just going to be minus 3k over 2x. So let me just tidy it up. Minus 3k over 2x. And then minus 3 times minus 4 is 12 over 2. So that's going to be 6. And then 6 times a uh, half square. So you can put this in a calculator. So what I would do, I would write all of this term in the calculator times, and I'll write 1 over 2 squared. So we're going to get 3 over 2. So it would be plus 3 over 2 x squared. Kx squared. Never forget, the, never forget the square to k as well, yeah? That's it. Close bracket. Of all that, guys, and well, if you were to expand this, you can clearly see that the first term a is going to be 1 eighth times 1, which is just 1 eighth. So the first value a is going to be 1 eighth. Okay, so the layer, the layer ones are going to deal with b and c. So let's have a look at them right now. Okay, here we go, part b and c. So here we need to find the values of k and b respectively. So now we already know that a was 1 eighth, wasn't it? Oops, let me write down here. a equals 1 eighth. I really love these pens. These pens are so vivid. It's so nice. <laughs> so now let's have a go. So expanding the right side, what do we get? So you go 1 eighth times 1 is an eighth. 1 eighth times 3 over 2. So that should give us, I believe, minus 3 over 16 kx. And then plus, and then we got 1 eighth times 3 over 2 again. So plus 3 over 16 k squared x squared. And the key idea is just to match coefficients. So we know a is 1 eighth, so that's fine. So matching left and right side, we can say that b must equal minus 3 over 16 k, just matching here with here. So I can say firstly, b must equal minus 3 over 16 k. We can also say that the second term, or the third term, 243 over 16, must equal the, the x squared coefficient, so 3 over 16 k squared. So 243 over 16 must equal 3 over 16 k squared. All right, so this one is fine. This is fine. So we can solve the second and well, that's fine. B straight after. So let's do it. So making k squared a subject, we can divide 243 over 16 by 3 16. What should I give us? So just yeah, just put that in the calculator, guys. And you guys should get um 81 so i got k squared equals 81 that this means that clearly square root in k will give us plus minus 9 but in this case we want 9 why because in the very beginning it said k is a positive constant so that's all we need and that's it putting k equals 9 into the b equation into this one here we can say now that b must equal 3 over 6 minus 3 over 16 times 9 so b equals minus over minus 3 of 16 times 9 and this should give us 9 times 16 and minus 27 over 16 and that's it guys i hope this video helped and let me know if you've got any other questions otherwise let's move to the next question <clears throat> so the table below shows corresponding values of x and y for this given function okay so we've got 6 over e to the power x plus 2. It's pretty standard stuff. Now, with our table, all we have to really do is pretty much find the missing value here and then round it to find decimal places. So, if you're not sure how to do this, all you have to do is plug in 0 0.2 for this value of x and then find y. So, in other words, you need to find, um, let me have a look, 6 over e to the power of 0 0.2 and then plus 2. And once you, do, once you enter the calculator, well, I've done it already, and I got a value of, let me see, 1.8625 and 4. So easy mark. Now, this is needed in order to pretty much do the trapezium rule. And the trapezium rule is used to find the area under a curve for a given function. And this is, instead of using integration or calculus, we can just use a nice formula. So this trapezium formula is given by this. So we could say that the, the area A under the trapezium rule would be um, the change in X or H over 2 times. And now all we have to do is, is pick two points, the, the, 
the value for y at the, at the end of, at the beginning of x and the value for y at the end of x. So x equals zero, y is two, x equals one, and y is this value. So it'll be two plus one point two seven one six five. So we just highlight we're picking these values. Plus and then you just do two times every other y value in between. So we're gonna pick these four y values. So make sure you put them all in. So it'll be one point eight six two five four plus dot dot dot. So all of them plus 1.41994 that's it so yeah so all of these are just the four values here yeah? and once you do that you should get a total area oh yeah the delta x just in case you know what this means this means the the change in x so what's happening in each step so we're going up in point twos so delta x here will just be 0 0.2 so 0 0.2 over 2 so yeah as i was saying put that in the calculator and you should get a final estimate area to four decimal places of 1.6413 for dp. That's it guys, that's pretty much um, how to handle the trapezium rule. Now for everyone else, let's move on. So Parsi, so anyway, this was this was an earlier sketch. So this tells us that Fig 1 shows a sketch of part of a curve with this given equation as we saw. So here is the area and we already evaluated that using trapezium rule. Now C. Use the substitution u equals e to the power x to show that the area of r can be given by this, where a and b are constants to be determined. So they pretty much tell us what to do. So they want us to say let u equal e to the x, and now we just have to use substitution to work this out. Quick heads up: the area in general of r, area of this um, curve, is just going to be the integral from zero to one. So we look at zero to one. So 0, 1 of 6 over ex plus 2 dx. So that's what we're trying to evaluate. So we need substitution to make it easy. Because e to the power x is quite difficult to work with at this stage. Now letting u be this term, differentiating this, so du over dx, this will just give us ex because this is a standard definition. And now we need to find an expression for dx. So we can say that dx, so rearrange this, multiplying dx across, and dividing by e to the power x, we should get dx, which is equal to du over e to the power x. Now to get now to keep this in terms of u, we already know that the value ex is, is also u. So dx is also equal to du over u. And that's it, guys. Now let's substitute everything back into this area, into this equation here. So we should have that the area is now the integral. So we'll do the limits in a second of 6 over so e e to the power x plus 2 is just u plus 2 times, and then dx is now du over u. That's it. As for the limits, so originally the limits are from 0 to 1. And remember, these are the x values, so x equals 0 and x equals 1. So if you plug it into the substitution of u, when x equals 0, so we're going to have e to the power u. So we're going to have u equals e to the power 0. This gives us a value of 1. When you plug in e to the power 1, you get a value of e. So in fact, the actual limits are from 1 to e. And hence, the final solution would be the integral of 1 to e, and then 6 over u times u plus 2, all from here, times du. And that's it, guys. This is how you prove the area of the equation. Done. Okay, guys. Now, the final part of the exercise is to work out the exact area, and this is using the method of integration by partial fraction decomposition. In other words, we're given this integral, which is 6 over u times u plus 2, all from 1 to e. And we need to realize that we can partition this fraction into a over u and b over u plus 2. And now all we have to do is work out the values a and b and then integrate these simple fractions, which will give you logs. So let's go ahead and do this, yeah? So let's say, um, let's, let's solve this. So we're going to have a, a, a fraction of 6 over u times u, 6 over u times u plus 2, which is equal to a over u plus b over u plus 2. Now, if we were to multiply everything by u and u plus 2, this first term will cancel the u, and then we're going to have u plus 2 attached to the a. So let's have, so we're going to have 6 equal a times u plus 2. As for b, if you multiply everything by u and u plus 2, the u plus 2 is a cancel, and you left with just a u, so it would be b u. Now, to calculate these values a and b, we just need to substitute some values for u to get to eliminate it. So let's say, let's let u equal 0 firstly. What happens? 
we're going to have 6 equals a times um, 0 plus 2, which would, just, which would just simply give us 2a. Let me just write it down quickly. So 2a. And then when you plug in um, u equals 0 for b, this would just become 0. So you're left with 6 equals 2a, and therefore a must equal 3. Easy stuff. Now, same thing applies here. So let another value for u. So now we're trying to find the value of b. So let's say let's say u equal minus 2, so then this part will cancel out. So when u equals negative 2, we're going to have 6 equals a times 0, which is 0, and then plus b times negative 2, so that would be minus 2b. And likewise, b here would equal minus 3. Easy stuff. And that means our, now our new integral is going to be the integral of, so replace a with 3, so 3 over u minus 3 over u plus 2. All respect to you and this is from 1 to e all right another cool thing is that we can just literally take out the u right now the 3 right now so we're gonna have 3 and then the integral of e to 1 1 to e and we're gonna have 1 over u minus 1 over u plus 2 du now this is just simple evaluation so let's plug in so every time we want to evaluate this a uh, fractional term this will just give us the log of u so we're gonna have firstly the log of u minus and then this term here will also give us the log of u plus 2 and this is from 1 to e just to make a quick note why this is log u plus 2 the key idea is to differentiate the bottom term and realize you get 1 so you stick 1 outside and then you smash it over into a log and that's what we just did is it'll be log u plus 2 so last thing to do now all you do is plug in the values for e and 1 so let's do it in two parts when we plug in the values for e, what do we get? I'll do it like this. So you're going to have log ln e, so this will give us 1. And put e here, we're going to have ln e plus 2. So we're going to have 1 minus ln. You can't actually do this, it. too tight. Let me, just, let me do let me do it underneath. So you're going to have 3 times. So over here, we're going to have 1 minus ln e plus 2. Now, the last term, so we're going to subtract against when we put 1. If you put 1 for the ln, you can have ln 1, which is 0, minus, and put 1 over here, we're going to have log 2. So ln 2. And that's it, guys. Now all you do is tidy this up, and then you'll realize that if you could just tidy this up easily, you got 0 minus this term, so this would be a positive log 2. So it would be 1 minus ln e plus 2 plus log 2. And simplifying all of it neatly, you should get 1 plus, let's see, log 2 over e plus 2 so log 2 over e plus 2 so here we're given a curve c with the following equation which is 4x squared minus y cubed minus 4xy plus y 2 to the power y and this is all set to zero it will also know, it is also known that the point p has coordinates minus 2 and 4 and this lies on this curve now, part A wants us to find the exact value once we differentiate this respect to x at the point P. In other words, differentiate and plug the p-values into here. So, what's happening? So, how to differentiate this, this entire equation? Well, most of it should be pretty okay. The key idea is that when you differentiate an x term, you do as you do. Because it, it says differentiate this respect to x. When you differentiate y, well, we're going to have a look exactly what happens there. So, step by step, each term. So the first thing, 4x squared, what happens? Well, we can say that 4x squared can be differentiated to get 8x. Remember, you drop the power down. Now, y cubed is, is quite easy. It just, you just drop the power like you do with the x term, so it would be 3y squared. And because it's y, you automatically have to multiply it by dy over dx. Just to indicate that it's been differentiated with respect to itself. Okay, so not so bad. That's literally all you do. Next one, minus. So notice how we got 4xy. So this is actually a product of 4x and y. So we can say, suppose, I don't know, let u equal 4x and um, say v equal y. Now we just use the product rule. So the derivative of 4x is, of course, 4. And the derivative of y is dy over dx because that's just what it is. And now using the product rule, so it's very easy. You just do u times v prime. So that would give us over here, so it'd be... 4x times dy over dx. And the next one would be v times u prime. So this term, so it'd be 
y times 4, so just be 4y. And remember, it's product, so we're going to be adding. So it'll be plus, and oh yeah, just one thing to know, I should put a bracket here, so it'll be plus 4y. So always put a bracket when you're dealing with individual products. Now, next part, so here comes a new one. So now we need to differentiate 2 to the power y. So there is a special technique to do this. I mean, sometimes you could just memorize the solution, but I think we should take our time. So let's say, let me write somewhere else. So suppose we have, um, let um, 2 to the power y be represented in terms of exponentials and logs. That's usually the best way to do it. We could say um, the exponential of the log of 2y, which is actually the same thing, by the way, just these two cancel out, can be rewritten as e to the power of y log 2. Now notice what I did here. I've made it e to the power y, which is a standard formula, like e to the power x, and now you've got a standard number, log 2. So if you just differentiate this, you would just drop log 2 down to the bot to the baseline. So let's have a go. Let's differentiate this term. If we were to differentiate, what would we get? So dif differentiate this, and you should get, well, drop log 2 down, because the, the, the derivative of y log 2 is just log 2 on the floor. And because you differentiate y, we multiply by dy over dx. And then we just copy the whole equation. So we can, instead of writing this back in, I'm going to go back and write 2 log 2 to the power y. So times 2 to the power y. So yeah, it does look like a long, long you know, four step procedure, but it's not too terrible. So literally, this is just going to be as you see. So we could just say log 2 times dy over dx times 2 to the power y, all equal to 0. Now, let us move on. So the question now tells us is that we've got to find the exact value of this equation, yeah? What well, the exact value dy of dx. So technically, we need to make it a subject. But before that, we could um, go ahead and collect terms, I think. I think that would just make it a lot easier. So let's make let's collect all the dy dx terms, yeah? So I'm going to put dy dx here. And notice that we have firstly minus 3y squared, so we can collect that. So collect all the like terms. And then expand this bracket, we can have minus 4x dy dx, so we can put minus 4x. And then we also have plus log 2 times 2 to the power y, so we can say plus, I'm going to rewrite it as 2 to the power y times log 2. Just avoid any confusion with 2 and 2y. And all of this, and now if we rearrange the rest of it, so I'm going to just copy the rest back in actually, that'll make it less confusing. So we, we didn't put plus 8x, so that's other term. We also got minus 4y and that's it done so now all i want you guys to do is replace the x and y values with minus 2 and 4 see what this term gives you and what this term gives you okay so let's evaluate this piece by piece because the reason why we need the exact value so we've got 3y squared minus 4x so plugging in x for minus 2 and y for 4 we should get so just bear me a second 4 squared minus 4 times minus 2 and I got minus 40 for these two terms so minus 40 and these two here so 2 to the power y log 2 2 to the power y 2 to the power 4 I believe is 16 if I remember yep so it'd be 16 log 2 and then finally looking at 8x minus 4y what do we get here so it'd be 8 times minus 2 minus 4 times 4 and I got minus 32 that's it guys literally we're literally done here so all we want to do now is pretty much rearrange this to make dy dx subject so by doing that by plusing 32 and dividing by minus 40 plus 16 log 2 we should get the following so let's see um okay so 32 across all over let me see um i'll put this first 16 log 2 minus 40. Now, can we simplify this firstly? So, they're all, div they're all divisible by 2, 4, yep, all divisible by 4, 8, yes, 8 as well. So, let's divide it all by 8. So, 32 divided by 8 will give us um, 4. <laughs> just I'm just checking if it's true. Yeah, of course it's 4. 16 divided by 8 will give us 2 log 2, and then minus 40 divided by 8 will give us uh, minus 5. So yeah, this should be the final answer, hopefully with no, you know, odd calculations. So double check if you get the same result as me. If not, just drop a comment below confirming it or just, just you know, let me know, guys, yeah? But hey, let's move on to part B. Okay, here we are, guys. So, part B now. 
So the normal to see at P means the y-axis at the point A. Okay, so we're gonna have um, a re negative reciprocal gradient. Find the y coordinate of A, giving your answer in the form P plus Q log two. Okay, and so on. So bottom line is the normal to see at point P. So this is um, point P, by the way, from the previous question. P was had these coordinates here minus two and four. So let me just note it down here. So P had minus two and four. And it's telling us this means the y-axis at the point A. So if this means at the this if this equation means the y-axis at point A, that means let's just have a look at the axis here. Let's just say I don't know this line hits over here. This means that we got we have an x coordinate of zero. So we know that we have an a coordinate of a zero. So let me write that a bit more clearer. So we've got zero, and we're trying to find the unknown, which is y. Okay, so this is this is quite straightforward, and because it's normal, because it's normal to see at the point P, it, it just means that the gradient is is reciprocated, and we have to flip it over with a negative sign. So this means that the new gradient, let's call it M here, will be one. So it will, it will be the reciprocal will be two log two minus five over four, and it'll be the negative. So I'll just put negative underneath, just to make it easy. Now, what do we do here? <clears throat> Let me just have a quick look. So we can just write a typical equation. So we need y equals mx plus c. We have the gradient and we have the corners. So another thing to note as well is that because it meets the normal at point c, we can also establish the fact that we have a point p. So we can sub in the values of minus 2 and 4 into this equation and the value of m and we can get a c. And then hence we can find the value of a. So let's do that quickly. So we can say that the coordinates would be 4 equals, um, so it would be minus 4, so it would be 2 log 2 minus 5 all over negative 4 times x, which is minus 2 plus c. So guys, unfortunately, it just has to be in, in um, exact form, so I can't, we can't just smash this in the calculator. Well, actually, maybe you can. Um, no, you can't, you can't, because of the log 2. So let's have a go. So minus 2 over minus 4, let's see. We could, of course... Um, multiply minus 4 across so that will cancel out so we're going to have minus 16 oh you know what to make it actually let's make it easy so i've already figured it out now let's just tidy up this one so cancelling out the negative signs these will cancel simplify the fraction this will disappear and this will be 2 so we've got 2 log 2 minus 5 over 2 subtracting that across we're going to have 4 minus 2 log 2 minus 5 over 2 and to keep the fractions the same we can multiply up and down on the left side by 2 so we're going to have now let me cross this out 8 over 2 and then this is of course equal to c and therefore we can say now that um, c is equal to so we can do 8 minus 2 log 2 minus 5 so 8 minus minus 5 will give us plus 5 so 8 plus 5 is uh, 13 so it'll be 13 plus 2 log 2 over 2 ah huh, not bad not bad at all <clears throat> so therefore what's our final equation so we can say now we're going to have an equation of y equals so that y equals mx plus c guys so we're going back to the normal equation we have a gradient of 2 log 2 minus 5 over negative 4 let's just do that so 2 log 2 minus 5 over negative 4 x plus c which is 13 plus 2 log 2 over 2 not easy and finally, find the y coordinate of a. So if we miss the x, miss axis, this means that x is zero. So we can say therefore, when x equals zero, therefore y equals so x equals zero. All of this cancels out. So we're left with literally thirteen plus two log two. And to keep in this form, well, we can have thirteen over two. So it'll be thirteen over two plus, and then q would just be one. So it'd be literally log two. And that means P is 13 over 2 and Q is 1. Ah, not bad, guys. Not bad at all. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another video. So here we're going to try and figure out the volume of integration for this particular problem here. So what we're trying to do exactly. So the question tells us that the finite region S the shaded region here is, is bounded by the wax axis, the y axis and the x axis, and the line of equation x equals the natural log of 4. 
and the curve of this given equation, which is the exponential equation plus 2 to e to the negative x. So what do we do here? So here they want us to rotate the rotate s through 2 pi radians about the x-axis. So what this means visually is like this. So you want to try and um, make a mirror view of this s um, shaded region so it looks a bit like this. And then just make a 3D image. So that's exactly what we're doing. And then we're trying to find this entire volume. So you think about it, this has a, a volume of 2 pi exactly. Because you're rotating 2 pi so that's 360 degrees. And the actual volume is given by the equation up here, which is v equals pi times the integral from a to b from the limits, so 0 to log 4, at y squared. Now, and that's it. That's all you want to do. So if you recognize this formula and it says rotate about x axis, you're going to be using this. So what do we do? So replace y squared with the equation. So if y equals e to the power x here, y squared will just be, well, the same equation squared. So just copy it out and now we'll just open expand like you do for quadratic problems so if you to do this using a double bracket method this one will simplify to here so let me write it down so we can say the volume is pi times the integral from 0 to log 4 so that's x so that's the values of x and what do we have so let's expand this y squared so y squared is going to be e to the power x times e to the power x so that's e to the power 2x then you've got e to the power x times 2 e to the power negative x so e ex negative ex cancel out so you left one and you're going to do it twice so two plus two you're going to get four and lastly you're going to have two e to negative x times two e to negative x which is going to be plus four e to negative two x times dx that's it so i believe that should be the correct expansion i mean guys just double check and just to make sure about this number four this was from doing e to power x times two e to negative x if you notice the powers, they cancel out, you get x take away x, so you just get 2, and you do it twice again, which will give you another 2, so the total is 4. Okay, so that's, that's how I got 4. Okay, so now here comes the easy part. So therefore, the volume is going to equal the integral, so it just integrating this now, which is I think is easy. So e to the 2x is just going to be e to the 2x over 2, simple integral. 4 becomes 4x. And e to negative 2x will drop negative 2 down, so you have minus 2e negative 2x. Okay, and this is all do, 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 from 0 to log 4. Alright, so that's the basics done. So now you just have to start plugging in values. Okay, so let's let's have a go. And we need to do this, oh god, in find the exact value. So let's see. So I'm gonna put the first one in so. Let's see if we can summarize this. Can we? No, we can. So we've got pi times. So let's see. Log 4. How does we put log 4? So you can have e to the 2 times log 4. So that's 2 log 4. So, ah, over 2. So you can see you can have to do some little algebra. So because you've got 2 log 4, you can just replace the 2 as a power. So it'll be 4 to the power 2. And then the e to the logs will cancel out. So do 2. So let me write that down now. So 4 squared over 2. 4 squared is 16. 16 divided by 2 is 8. Okay, now for the second part. So you've got 4 times the log of 4. Well, I'll just keep it as it is. So plus 4 ln 4. And next one, you've got 2 e to negative 2x. So replacing x with log 4, I've already done in my calculator and i got minus 1 over 8. So you can, if you can put the whole thing in, it'll automatically simplify. Now just tidying this up before we move to the next one, we've got 8 take away 1 over 8. So that should give us, bear with me guys, 63 over 8. So yeah, let me just simplify that. So 63 over 8. So do 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 over 8. Okay, so that's that's the first part done. So minus now, replace everything with 0. So you've got e to the power 0, which is 1, so it'll be half here. And e to the power 0 here would be just 1, so it'll be just 2. And put a zero here, you're going to get zero. So it'd be half plus zero minus two. So I, I can write it down. So half plus zero minus two. And then let's just have a go simplifying this. So you've got half take away two, it will give us negative three over two. And then minus minus that will give us a positive three over two. So let's let's combine that. So 0.5 minus two. So plusing it, so it'll be 63 over 8. So I'm, let me put the negative 3 over 2, guys. 
So we're just tidying all of this inside. So we have pi times, so we got 63 over 8 plus 3 over 2. So 1.5 plus 63 over 8. Usually I record my answers, but I'm doing this all first, all, all in a row. So I'll go 75 over 8. So that's going to be your final result here. So all of this becomes 75 over 8. And I think that's it, you know. I think, I think we could pretty much live like this. So it states that with respect to a fixed origin O, the lines L1 and L2 are given by the following pair. So line 1 is given by this of equation which is known as the position vector where the first column i.e the first set of vectors is the initial vector initial initial position and d is the direction so this is very useful to knowing which direction the vector is going and same over here and then we're given some constants lambda and mu which represent scalar parameters like a like a common factor now this question tells us that lines l1 and l2 intersect at point x so you've got a picture a bit like this where you've got two lines oops two lines going in in the same direction also and they intersect somewhere here and let's just call this one x okay and we just have to find our coordinates here so that's really that's really all we have to do really that's all we have to do so the key idea to do this is simply to notice that when these two intersect that means that these two equations must equal each other or well, at least it's better to say that the i's the will equal each other the j's vectors will equal and the k vectors so remember the first row the first row is are the i's the middle row j's and the last row the k's so we could say for example that 4 plus lambda times minus 1 which is 4 minus lambda must equal the second line which is l plus lambda uh, mu times 3 which is 5 plus 3 mu so notice how we've got two variables so we, we just need a second pair of uh, equations so we, so we can solve this simultaneous equation now next one we could say 28 plus lambda times minus 5 or 28 minus 5 lambda is equal to the right side which is just 3 plus 0 mu or 3. And that's it guys, just solving this simultaneously we can find that lambda and mu can both equal 5 and, and uh, was it negative 2. And lastly all you want to do now is just plug this into one of these equations. So for example, I'm going to take the second one because it looks a bit easy. But the bottom line is, I've, if you put lambda, into lambda 5 here or mu equals negative 2 here, you should get the exact same position vector. That's the expected result. So we can say that, so therefore the x can equal, so I'm going to take the second one, 5 plus 3 mu, or 3 or 1 minus 4 mu is equal to when at the, at the point of mu at minus 2, should give us position vector of minus 1, 3 and 9. Okay, so for this problem, I've, I've already gone ahead and decided to highlight and circle what is necessary to actually solve this problem. For example, D1 and D2 represent the directional vectors for the lines L1 and L2 respectively. And the question is telling us is that we need to find the size of the acute angle between L1 and L2. And this acute angle means an angle less than 90, given that the, your answer is in, deg is in degrees to two decimal places. Okay, all right, two decimal places, so it should be a whole figure. So how do we do this? Well, let's have a look. <clears throat> so all you have to do is realize that there is a special formula, which is the cos theta, which equals the dot product between the two directional vectors over the magnitude of each one. And the magnitude is simply um, using 3D Pythagoras on a direction. And this is how the equation is expected to look like. So, the, the, I mean, because it's intersecting, it could be here. The Q angle could be in any of these positions, either here, 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 or here. Wherever the answer is, if it's not acute, then it's going to be 180 minus the answer to give you the Q angle. Now, let's go ahead and calculate the, uh, every single thing here. So, what is the dot product between the directional vectors? Well, that's simply saying we have to multiply the, the i, j, and k column independently. So, we're going to say minus 1 times 3 will give us minus 3 plus minus 5 times 0 give us 0 so this is the sum product basically 1 times minus 4 is negative 4 and now the magnitude is simply like this you just have to use 3d pythagoras on the first directional vector so of these ones here so it'd be the square root of minus 1 squared plus minus 5 squared plus 1 squared and you should get a result of root 27 
Likewise, if you do the magnitude of, of D2, you should do the same thing. So it would be 3 squared plus 0 squared plus negative 4 squared. And this one, likewise, will give you a root 25 or just a 5. And hence, the final solution at the bottom would be the magnitude of D1 times magnitude of D2, which is just going to be 5 root 27. All right, so it looks like we're getting somewhere now, isn't it? So all you have to do is, is solve this, find the value of cos theta, cos inverse here. And when you cos inverse all of this, you should get, what did I get last time? I got 105.6 degrees. So, oh, it's actually um, two different places. Whoops, I just deleted it. Um, cos inverse minus 7 over 5 root 27 uh, degrees. Oops, degrees. And I got 105.63 degrees. So therefore, because it's um, bigger than 90, we're going to have to find the acute angle. So 180 minus 105.63 should give us the acute angle of uh, answer 74.37.37 degrees. And that's it, guys. Hello fellow mathematicians, so here we need to calculate the distance AX, which means the distance from point A to point X and then reduce the answer as a simple third. Now to calculate this is very easy, so let me get my pen. All you simply have to do is realize that AX simply means, well the distance AX simply means from, X to, from A to X. And to easily calculate, we just take the difference from X to A between them, so it'd be X minus A. The key idea is that you always do the second minus the first. That's usually how it's represented. Now, all we do is look, consider both points. We look at point A, which is given here as 2, 18, and 6, and X, which is considered, which is given as minus 1, 3, and 9. Now, subtracting X from A from X, we're going to have minus 1 take away 2, which will give us uh, minus 3. 3 take away 18 is negative 15, and 9 take away 6 is positive 3. That's it guys, this is literally your new vector. And now this distance can actually be found by calculating the magnitude of AX. So the distance is literally the magnitude of AX. And again, this is just using the, the 3D Pythagoras. And all you have to do is literally open the square root and then square every single term in that vector. So you're going to have minus 3 squared plus minus 15 squared plus 3 squared. And then smash this in the calculator and you should get 9 root 3. And that's it guys, that's all you do to calculate the distance. Okay, part D guys. So we know a couple of pieces of information here. It states that the point Y lies on L2 and then given that the vector Y to A is perpendicular to the line L1 where point A lies on L1 with this position vector, we need to calculate the distance YA. Okay, so that's fine. So before we do this, this actually encompasses a few things from previously. We need to see how the diagram looks like. And well, it actually looks a bit like this. You see? So I've actually gone ahead and drawn it. So we've got the line L2 crossing here. And if we recall, L1 and L2 intersect at point X. We found this in the earlier statement. The lines L1 and L2 intersect at X. We also calculate the Q angle. Find the size of the Q angle between L1 and L2, which was 74.4. And that is here. We also calculate the line AX, which is here, 9 root 3. So, looking at this carefully, we've got a clean right angle triangle to work with. And um, what else can we see here? So, we can actually use a few things. We could use, um, in this case, Sokotoa to work this out. Or we could use a sine rule to figure out the next angle. But yeah, let's, let's go ahead and find this distance, which is, let's, let's just label the side um, X. Okay, for convenience sake. So, from here, you can picture a right angle triangle. So, we have a nice simple one with length 9 root 3, length x here, and the opposite angle would be 74.4 degrees. Okay, so good old trick. Now, to do this, we just have to consider labeling some sides. So because this is the opposite, we can call this side O. So let me just write O here. And we can call this side the adjacent. So oops, let me get my pen. Adjacent. And lastly, guys, so now we got this, we just need to use the relationship of so, oops, so ka toa and for those of you guys who don't know so ka toa is the trig relationship between sine cos and tan where o is opposite a is adjacent and h is the hypotenuse now which one do we use 
The way this works, you look at your right angle triangle and ask yourself what was involved. Well, we can see that the O is involved in the A. And the only thing that's O and A is TOA. So this implies that tan of the angle, 74.4 uh, degrees. Wait, what was the correct angle? 74.37, I think that's more accurate. But anyway, same thing. Must equal opposite over the adjacent. And opposite over the adjacent is actually um, X over A. So let me write down X over 9 root 3. And therefore, to find X, well, you just multiply 9 root 3. So it'd be 9 root 3 times tan 74. Point, well, let's, let's write the original one 37 degrees. And that's it, guys. You just worked out and then you have your length. And if you did work out, what, let's, let's see what we get. So, oh yeah, make sure your calculator is in, um, in degrees mode, yeah? So, 9 root 3 times, I should, I should have done this before, 74.37. And I got 55.7, um, 7 point, what is it, meters? Kilometers, I don't know. So length for 55.7. So right here, so x equals 55.7. Uh, let's say meters, I'm not sure what, or units. Okay, and lastly, part E. So here we need to, it says that the point B lies on L1, where the absolute value of AX equals two times the absolute value of AB. So, and just to recall, these are the magnitudes. Now, find the two possible position vectors of B. Okay, so before we do this, I've wrote down the list of key information that we should have from previous problems, or, and at least ones that's related to this question. So we need to know that the, the absolute value AX we found earlier was 9 root 3, so that's good. The position vector A is 2, 18, and 6. And then the position vector B, because since B lies on this position, position vector of L1, we know that if we just let lambda equals B, then we can pretty much find it. Okay, so this is an expression for a position vector in B. I don't want to confuse it with the letter lambda, so I replace lambda with B. Now, to find AB, well, in this case, we just need to subtract these two. So we do B take away A. Now, let's have a go at that. So what is B take away A? So let me get my pen. So it's, go it's going to be 4 minus B take away 2, which will give us uh, 2 minus B. 28 minus 5B take away 18 will give us 10 minus 5B. And then 4 take away 6 will give us negative 2 and then plus B. Easy stuff. Now, all you have to do is really just take the absolute value of this. So to do that, I'm going to do on this side, actually. So the absolute value of AB, let's have a look. This is simply going to be using Pythagoras' theorem. So it's going to be, oh, well, it's going to be actually one long equation. So, you know what, let me, let me put another side, actually. Let me just do the whole thing at once. So solving this entire equation here, AX equals 2 times AB, we're going to have, therefore, 9 root 3 equals 2 times the absolute value, which is the square root, so it's going to be a big one, of every single AB term squared. So let's have a look. So we've got 2 minus B squared plus 10 minus 5B squared um, plus, I'm going to rearrange this, B minus 2 squared. Okay, okay, so that's, that's quite big, isn't it? Let's have a careful look at this. So let's like go ahead and expand each one, yeah? So this is just a case of just long algebra. So expanding the inside, so I'm gonna keep it like this. Two minus B all squared should give us four minus so two B, so four B plus B squared. Next, 10 minus five B all squared should give us 100 minus, so we've got five times 10 is 50. 100 should be minus 100 B plus five B squared is 25 B squared. And lastly, B minus two all squared should give us b squared minus uh, uh, 4b plus 4. And that's it, guys. All of this. And this all equals, of course, 9 root 3. Now, to get rid of the square, firstly, I'll divide 2 across. So we have 9 over 2. And then, squ and then squaring everything. So let's just do a little bit of algebra. So dividing 2, this 9 becomes 9 over 2. And to clear this one out, we just have to square both sides. So let me just quickly square this. So 9 over 2 root 3 all squared. So you should get 60.75. Or you know what? 243 over 4. 
And now, collecting like terms in the in this root. So the root is gone now, by the way. That's gone. So look at let's count all the b squares. So we've got b squared here, 25. So we've got 27b squared. <clears throat> so you're gonna do you're gonna have to use a quadratic formula afterwards. And then next one will give you so minus will be minus 104. So those can also you can get minus 100 b and then 404 plus 108 and then subtracting 243 over 4 from 108 should give us 47.25 or 189 over 4 okay so let me just update these figures so plus 189 over 4 and all this equals 0 Okay guys, so what I did, I just cleared the entire board and just checked everything and I realized I was supposed to put a minus sign for uh, 4b for the previous one, so it should be minus 108b. I've also flipped the letter b to beta so it doesn't mess up with the quadratic formula because b is already used, so I'm using beta. Okay, so I'm guessing everyone's familiar with the formula, so I'm just going to go ahead and go with it. Where In this case, a would be 27, b is minus 108 and c is 189.04. So this is what we get. So your equation should be something like this. 108 plus minus the square of 108. So it be 108 squared minus 4 times A, which is 27, and C, 189 over 4. All over 2 times 27. And the two results you should get for beta should be mm, 3.5. And the second one should be... B, so flip it. So this is the plus positive answer. If I put the negative, I got 6.75. So nice, almost round number. So this, this one looks good. And all you do is literally just plug it back to, into here and just update the value. So I'm going to leave this one here. But the final solution should be substituting these back in and you're done. And thanks for watching, guys. Figure 3 shows a vertical cylindrical tank of height 200 cm containing water. Water is leaking from a hole P on the side of the tank. So here is a hole P. So this looks like a, a derivative equation or a differential equation. So at time t minutes after the leaking starts, the height of the water in the tank is h cm. So this is the current height at the moment. Okay. The height h cm of the water in the tank satisfies the differential equation. Alright, so we have this right here, and just to make it clear, this height occurs at some time t, okay, so this is when it happens. So given that h equals 130, the height of the water is falling at a rate of 1.1 centimeters per minute. So here is the key word, so because it states that it's falling, in other words, there's a decrease at this rate, this means that the derivative of h respect to t is going to be a negative 1.1, that's what it means, the height decreasing at this time. So we can say, therefore, dh over dt is going to be minus 1.1. And we, all we have to do is find the value of k. So it be 1.1 equals k times height, which is 130. So 130 take away 9 is 1 to 1, or to the power of half. And that's it, guys. So k is going to equal minus 1.1 over the square root of 121. And I think I know the answer mentally, but <laughs> I don't want to take that risk. But yeah, you actually get the answer should be minus 0 0.1. That's it. That's literally your value k. Okay, guys, here we go. Part B. So given that the tank was full of water when the leaking started, where our derived differential equation is given by this, where k is minus 0 0.1 and h is the height, solve the differential equation with your value of k being minus 0 0.1 to find the value of t when h is 50. Okay, so first thing we have to do is pretty much... Uh, figure out how to solve this differential equation. Well, the key idea is that we need to move all the h terms with the dh and all the non, and all the t terms, or well, in this case, non-h terms to t. So let's let's go ahead and move this equation. So what we could do is firstly times dt across and divide by h minus nine power half. So we should have uh, dh over h minus nine to the power of half. And because we've got h and dh in the same place, we can now pop in the integral sign. And same thing here. So now we've got k times dt. And k we know is negative 0.1. So I'm going to go ahead and write that now. So this would be negative 
0.1 dt. And I can just put one well, integral sign here, plus c, because this is just a constant and integral dt is just well t. Now let's do this. So how to integrate this bottom equation? Well, if you're not sure, I would just use um, substitution. So let u equal h minus 9. So on the side, a little working out. So just say let u equal h minus 9. Therefore, du equals, and then differentiate this, will give you dh. Easy stuff. Not bad. So now all you have to do is really know is that we can replace h minus 9 with u and dh with du. So nothing really changes. So now we've got the integral of, um, and I'm going to move, make this 1 over u to the power of half du. And just rewriting this again, this can be the same, this is the same as u to the power of negative half, because you can just raise the power up and put a negative sign. And this is going to equal to, and the right hand side would be minus 0 0.1, and integral of dt would just be t, and hence plus c. Now, evaluating the left side, integrating this one is easy. You just raise the part up by one and then just drop it down. So it's just going to be power of a half over half, which is the same as two times u to the power of half. Okay, so far so good, not bad, not bad at all. Now, one thing we have to really spot is this sentence here. So remember it says, given that the tank, oops, wrong one. Given that the tank was full of water when the leak in started, so that tells us that because the tank was full, it was at a height of 200, and this began at, as soon as the leak started, or, and this would be at time zero. This is just the initial point. So let's plug in these values here, because then we can actually find a value of C. So when T is zero and H is 200, so when H is 200, this means U equals 200 take away nine, which is 191. So we're gonna have, therefore, U times, and power half makes the square root, square root of 191, equals 0 point, minus 0 0.1 times times um, 0, which is going to give us 0 plus c. So therefore, c must be uh, 2 root 191. Let me see if I can simplify that, but I don't think I can. Nope, so c is 2 root 191. Okay, good. Now, rewrite this whole equation now back in, so we're going to delete all of this. Um, delete. Okay, so this can give us plus 2 root 191. Okay, we're almost done here, guys. Almost done. Okay, so now all you have to do is literally plug in your other initial condition, which is um, the value of t when h is 20. So that's fine. This is actually the easy part. This is just simple algebra. So when, t, when h is 20, this means that u is going to be 20 take, uh, 50 take away 9, which is 41. So we're going to have 2 times the square root of 41, because u to the power half, equals minus 0 0.1 t plus 2 root 191. And just some, a quick little algebra, and making t the subject, you should, you should basically subtract 2 root 191 across and divide them by 0 0.1, so something like this, minus 2 root 191 over negative 0 0.1, you should get a t value of... Um, 148 to 3 sniffing figures. Now it tells us that a figure 4 shows a sketch of part of the curve C with parametric equations given by the following. Okay, the point um, P at K8 lies on C, which is the curve, where K is a constant. So, first things first, figure 4 looks a bit like this. So, here is your curve C. And we can see the point P at K8 is over here. So when X equals K and Y equals 8. And I just copied it down here just to make it clearer. Now what can we do here? So my advice when trying to find the values of K is to actually look at the parameter equation and just plug in what you know and then work from there. Okay? So let's do it. So we can say straight away that when K is 8, this entire equation... Um, sorry, when X is K, this equation reduces to... Uh, k equals 3 theta sine theta. So, so far we can't really do much of this, unfortunately. So, we'll leave it like that. The second part is this. We have y equals sec cubed theta. So, we can replace the second, replace y with the value of 8. And we should get exactly 8 equals. And instead of sec 
um, cubed, I'll convert this to 1 over cos cubed because uh, cos is the inverse of sec. So something like this, cos cubed theta. And I'll just rewrite this to make cos cubed the subject. So we can have cos cubed theta. So, so take the reciprocal above, you should get this. Cos cubed equals 1 over 8. And now to, to find cos theta on its own, to isolate it, you can just um, cube root it and you should get cos theta equals a half. All right, so, so far so good. Now there's two ways of approaching this. You could look at both equations and say, hey, we could use some trig identities, yeah? Well, actually you can. You see the very first equation we looked at over here? We can make sine theta the subject here. And by doing that, we can divide three theta across. Could work, but then you'll realize that we'll still have a theta in the equation. So alternatively, the best way to go about this would be to actually find the value theta directly and plug in to find k okay so using your calculator finding the cos inverse of half and remember put into radio mode you should get pi over three so so far so good technically you could just literally plug everything in and get the answer which you know i'll go ahead and do that another way you could do is find the value sine theta directly by using the sine squared plus cos squared method and doing so you should get sine theta to wound up as root 3 over 2. So just to just recap, we're using this identity here, okay? The classic identity. And plugging in half over here and rearranging to make sine theta, you should get this. So yeah, all in all, by putting all these values out there, it should tell us now that k equals 3 times theta, which is pi over 3, times sine theta, which is um, root 3 over 2 tidying this up and to find the exact value the threes here cancel out so you're left with root three over two times pi and that's it guys that's part a done okay so the final region r shown shaded in figure four so it's talking about this region right here is bounded by the curve c as we can see over here the y-axis and the x-axis and the line with equation x equals k all right show that the area of r can be represented in this kind of form Whew. so it looks quite frightening but actually it's quite easy where each of these components are constant so we've got lambda here and so on and the, we've got the two limits notice how the entire equation is is in theta so that's going to be our final form now the first thing we need to realize is that this is a graph of x and y so to find the area under the curve it's always going to look a bit like this the area is always going to be in this form the integral from um, some limits let's say a and b of y dx this is the standard you know general area form so we're going to begin with this okay let's write it down here so go a b y this is the region r uh, dx now as you can see we just need to start replacing components and remember a and b are x values yeah so let's have a look so from a quartile graph we can see that the x limits are 0 and k and we found out that k was root 3 over 2 so let's put it here. So, so far we got when x equals 0 limit, x equals root 3 over 2. We know our y value. Our y value is given in the previous problem. It is, it's actually sec cube theta. So plug that in. Sec cube theta. And we still got our dx. So, not so bad. So our objective really is to replace x equals 0, x equals root 3 over 2, or your root 3 over 2 pi. Almost got that off. And dx. To do this, we need to go back to our x equations now. So let's have a look at x. Where's x? So x equals 3 theta sine theta. So now the first thing we're going to do is say let x equals 0 and solve this one, and then let x equals root 3 over 2 pi and solve it. So let's do it. So we can say straight away when x equals 0, the equation reduces to. Uh, 3 theta sine theta equals 0. Now clearly this means that either 3 theta must be 0 or sine theta must be 0 and either way when you solve this they both give you 0. So that's our first limit done. x equals 0 becomes theta equals 0. Now for the second case when x equals the k value which was root 3 over 2 pi the equation becomes 3 sine theta times sine theta equals uh, root 3 over 2 pi now one thing to note here is that this is not easy to solve but we actually solved it already back in part a 
Remember, the only way to find the value k was we had to find value theta ahead of time. And to make this true, we had to choose the value of pi of theta equals pi over 3. So that is the only way to solve this. So therefore, we solved it already. We can instantly say that theta equals pi over 3 to make this statement here true. Okay, that's the only way. So that's three, that's two done. Now how about the final bit, so the dx bit. So we've got the limits done, now we need to replace dx. Well that's easy, we go back to the original x equation and well just differentiate, find dx over d theta and then rewrite this in terms of, make dx subject and replace it into the integral and you're done. So let's do it. So using the, the, the equation x equals uh, three theta sine theta, we can say therefore dx over d theta is going to be the following. So this is firstly the product rule. So you can assign some variables. Let me just change the color of the pen. Okay. So we can say, let's do it here. We can say let u equal 3 theta and v equal sine theta. Now differentiating u will give us uh, 3. Differentiating sine will give us cos. Now using the product rule, we just we just cross multiply, yeah. So it'll be diagonal multiply. So it'll be v with u prime and u with v prime. So firstly, let's start u. So it'll be three theta times cos theta will give us three theta cos theta plus because it's a product, and three times sine theta is three sine theta. And now remember we want to replace dx, so we need to make dx subject. So we can say dx equals from the original equation and factorize in three. Theta cos theta plus sine theta times d theta. And that's it, guys. Plug this back in and you should have a complete equation. Okay, so let me just make room for this on a new page. It might be easier that way. Okay, so let's do it over here. So now rewriting our integral. So firstly, the limits. When x, x equals 0 became um, theta equals 0, we can put 0. And x equals, uh, what was that one? x equals uh, root 3 over 2 pi became pi over 3. So put the limit there. So remember, everything is in terms of theta now, yeah? And we still had sec cube theta, and we have got dx. So let's replace dx and then put this in, because we can see sec squared comes after. So replacing dx, is got, it's going to be all of this, 3 times these lot. And because we've got a constant 3, you can just throw it outside, so that's fine. And now we're going to have um, theta cos theta plus sine theta and then oh, I could stick the d theta now but I'll leave it here and then I'm going to put the previous term which was already there sec cube theta let me just put in a different color ink sec cube theta and that's it so this is where we should be now now what we have to do here is realize that the equation they want us is, is in this form so they kind of simplified actually they got sec squared so they took out a, at least one part of the sec from the set cube. Now, look at this right, with close inspection. Let's let's go ahead and simplify it. Okay, so we can say that cos theta times set cube theta. And remember, set cube in terms of um, cos, cos theta times set set cube is one over cos cube theta. So you can see you cancel one single cos cube, so you're left with one over cos squared, which is literally sec squared. So that's done. So we're gonna have theta sec squared. Plus, and then same thing, sine times this term. So sine theta times 1 over cos cube theta, because that's sec cube. And you can just partition it. You can take a single cos here, so it'll be sine theta over cos theta times 1 over cos squared. And this first term becomes a tan. The second one becomes a sec squared. And we're done. And that's exactly the form they want us to, to keep in. Sec squared theta d theta. And that's it. And then finally, to conclude, we can just say, therefore, wait, there's a question, therefore, lambda is the constant 3 here. Um, alpha and beta are the limits, 0 and pi over 3. And that's it. That's part B concluded. Now, hence, we need to use integration to find the exact value of this area. Okay, so with this kind of integral, you have to realize that Yes, you could factorize sec squared theta outside, but then that'll pose a problem because we won't be able to use substitution to solve it properly. In fact, it'll, it'll probably be worse. So for me, for my personal advice on this kind of question, you should partition this into two different integrals. 
I mean, we could discuss this at the bottom, what the best solution was when you guys did it. But this is how I'm going to do it. First, I'm going to label this integral as R1 and then the right side as R2. So I'm going to integrate them separately. So I find the integral of theta sec squared theta first and then the integral of tan theta sec squared theta as R2. And then in the end, I'll add them up and then multiply by 3 to find the actual full region. So let's do it like that. So let's go on to the first one. So here, I say that we need to integrate this by parts. Why? Because um, we have a simple theta here. And you can treat this, imagine this was x. This would be quite easy to differentiate and eliminate it as it would just be 1, it would just become a constant. If you did it by substitution, well, it just wouldn't work. It would be quite complicated. So, let's have a go. So the first thing you want to do is start labeling terms. So again, this is easy to differentiate. So I'm going to call this u for our uv integration by parts formula. So we could say let u equal theta and v prime be the second term. So now, just a quick note, this one's also easy to integrate. This will give you a, a tan theta because it's, it's, it's the standard definition. So let's have a go. So u prime will give us 1 and then integrating sec squared will give us a nice tan because the derivative of a tan is sec squared. Okay, now, easy stuff. So using the bypass formula, what do we have? The bypass tells us that we need to do firstly uv, so these two, minus the integral of these two, so u prime v. Now that means that we're going to have this. So u times v is theta times tan theta, so we'll just draw that in. And don't forget there's limits involved, so it's from pi over 3 to 0, minus the integral of 1 times tan theta, which is, like, which is just tan theta. And don't forget, we've got limits here as well. Now, so far so good. I mean, the first part is easy to, to solve. We just plug everything in the calculator. If you plug in pi over 3, you should get um, pi over 3 here. And tan theta should be root 3. So, ultimately, this should give us um, pi, root 3 pi over 3. If you plug in 0, well, this will cross everything out because 0 times anything is 0. So, that's done. Now let's go ahead and integrate this term here. Yeah? So let me just change the color of the pen. So let's see. So if you're not sure how to integrate tan theta, the way I do is I always rewrite it as uh, the integral of sine theta over cos theta, because this is easy to work with. And we can know it's, it's easy because we can just let u be one variable cos and differentiate, we should get some sine term, and then these two will eliminate, and it will become 1 over u, or in this case, negative 1 over u. Let's check it out. So we can say let u equal the bottom part, always let it be the bottom part, yeah? Cos theta, and then differentiate this one, we should get negative sine theta, and then, oh yeah, d theta, and then multiply d theta across, it should be uh, minus sine theta, d theta. So, yeah, so now all you have to really do is just pretty much observe it here. And now we just say, okay, in this case, we can just see that we've got sine theta d theta. We have sine theta d theta, and that must equal, and just take the negative on the other side, that must equal minus du. Sine theta d theta equals minus du, cos theta is u. So this integral, replacing every term, cos is now 1 over u, because u is at the bottom, and sine d theta is negative du, so minus du. And this is pretty much, um, take the negative outside, this is just 1 over u du. Lovely. And then integrating this will give us the natural log, so it would be negative ln u. Alright, and ln u is obviously cos theta, so the final bit will be negative ln uh, cos theta. So let me do it over here, so this would be root 3 pi over 3 minus ln cos theta. And now we just plug in the limits from pi over 3 to 0. Only for this bit, yeah? Alright, and then doing that, you should get a final result of all of this should reduce to just simply a log 2. And that's the end of the R1 solution. Okay, here we go. Now, let's integrate this one. So, I call this one R2 because it was the second part of the integral we need to solve. And here we're using the method by substitution. So, let's have a go. So how do we select which one to, to let the which which variable to be u? So the, the key thing is, is to realize that one of these should differentiate into each other. 
And if you know your differentiation rules, we should know that tan theta differentiates it becomes sec squared theta. And that would be perfect because then that means we can eliminate it all at once. Let's go ahead and do it. So let's say we said let u be represented by tan theta. So differentiating this, du over d theta, this should give us a nice sec squared theta, which is perfect. And then all we have to do is just make the variable sec squared theta d theta. And we can do it here by multiplying d theta across. We're going to have du equals sec squared theta d theta. And here we go. All of this clearly equals du. So we can replace all of this with du. And tan theta is just simply u. And yeah, it looks, it looks to me like we're done, isn't it? So now our new integral is going to be um, u times du. And <laughs> this is easy. u du is just going to be u squared over 2. And oh yeah, don't forget we've got limits as well. And then so yeah, this is going to be of course equivalent to um, tan squared theta over 2 with the limits applied. If there was no limits, you would just say plus c. Well, we clearly got limits here. And we're going to put the limits from pi over 3 to 0. All right, so... And so our final result, after plugging pi over 3, it should give us root 3 squared, so which is just simply 3, so we can get 3 over 2. And a plug in 0, we should get, well, tan theta 0, so 0. So the final result for R2 should be 3 over 2. Yeah, not bad. Now, to finish this off, if you remember carefully, we need to add up both R1, R2, and then multiply by 3 in the end. So let's go ahead and plug everything in. So back in um, for R1, our final result was, actually you can see, even simplify this further, root 3 pi over 2 is just pi over root 3, and then the final part is minus log 2. So let's go ahead and put this in. So pi over root 3 minus log 2, so overall R equals 3 times uh, pi over root 3 minus log 2, plus, now R2 we said was uh, 3 halves. So, three halves. Yeah, and that's it. Now we just tidy this up, and therefore R should give us a nice, da -da -da, let me think, 3 pi over root 3 minus 3 log 2 plus 9 over 2. I'm not sure how you should simplify further, but I think this should be it. Let me just think. So, could you simplify this one? Yes, you can split 3 as root 3 root 3. So that becomes, and these root 3's cancels out. So you should get root 3 pi. So let me see if I can simplify this. So therefore, r could also equal root 3 pi minus, if you had to put this in a single form, you can raise the power to 3 to 2, so it'd be log 8. But that doesn't really look simplified, does it? Plus 9 over 2. So, I mean, there's various combinations, but yeah, somewhere in this form, and you should be it. But that's it, guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. And um, if you did, let me know how you did. Show me your final results for this question because I would like to know what you guys also got and it would help me to provide best solutions for everybody else. Anyways, hope you guys enjoy this and have a nice day, yeah? And we shall speak soon. Ciao.